as if chemistry wasn't hard enough. You have to deal with math, conversions, and then on top of it, lab reports. Let's dive into some tips and tricks and definitions and explanations of what you can use to succeed in your lab report. Welcome to The Flock. In pretty much any lab setting you'll ever be in, you're going to be making qualitative and or quantitative observations. What's the difference between the two? I like to think of qualitative like quality. Can you hear it? Can you see it? Can you smell it? Can you taste it? Those are all physical details to describe what it is you're looking at or experimenting with. Those would be qualitative observations, i.e. anything that doesn't have numerical values associated with them. However, quantitative observations, I like to think of the word quantity, like how much, those are observations that involve a numerical value. So if you were going to say, take the mass of something specific in a lab and write down its mass in grams or pounds or what have you, that would be a quantitative observation. Or if you were going to measure the distance with a ruler, that specific distance is going to be a direct measurement, all quantitative. I have a bone to pick with this hypothesis thing. If you've seen pretty much any Netflix series or any series in general, you've heard the word theory used incorrectly in place of hypothesis. Every time I hear someone say theory incorrectly, I want to cringe and my spine just like shrinks up when they should be saying hypothesis instead. A hypothesis is a testable statement based on your understanding of any particular situation. In contrast, a theory is something that's been tested over and over and over and over again and has stood the test of time. Gravity is a theory because we have literally tested things falling down to the earth for hundreds of years. It is a theory. It is no longer considered a hypothesis that gravity exists because it's been tested so much. However, if it's something that you are just recently testing, you would call it a hypothesis. When you perform an experiment, you're going to use a hypothesis as your prediction of what should happen. Now notice that this is a prediction, not a guess. You are not guessing, you're not blankly throwing darts in a dark room at what you think might happen. That is not what a hypothesis is. A hypothesis is using your own logic and your common knowledge of an experience or of a phenomenon to come up with a realistic prediction of an outcome not a guess. This is also something frequently misunderstood. A hypothesis is not a question. It's a statement. It's something that you think is going to happen. It's your prediction. You're not questioning it. You are stating it. The thing that is a question, however, is the researchable question. This is the fundamental core of the entire research project or the experiment itself. It's the one thing that focuses on the study. It's the thing that determines how you're going to test it and guides all the stages of inquiry thereafter. It's essentially the question that popped into your head that led you to do the experiment to begin with. Let's see if you understand this concept. Which of the following, A, B, or C, would be an appropriate researchable question? A, how many drops of yellow egg yolk are required? B, is the presence of yellow egg yolk necessary for vesicle formation, that's a cell? Or C, is the egg yolk composed of phospholipids, that's a fat? Go ahead and pause and see if you can find the correct researchable question. Hopefully you picked B as the obvious answer here. Is the presence of yellow egg yolk necessary for vesicle formation? This is what could guide the entire rest of the experiment. The whole reason why you would try and figure out if egg yolk would cause vesicle formation. The other ones are more like procedural for A and more like figuring out what the chemical composure is for C as opposed to what it can do in an experiment. Now the variables are where I saw a lot of students get confused. The independent variable is the thing that's tested. That's the thing that's changed or controlled in the experiment by you. It's the thing that you manipulate in the experiment. For example, if we were going to look at the effect of caffeine on test performance, caffeine would be the independent variable, i.e. you can control how many numbers of cups of coffee your test participants are going to drink before they take this test. 
Now, the dependent variable, their test performance, is the thing that you are going to measure the changes for. Perhaps if they have 10 cups of coffee before the test, their test completely plummets because they're doing this the entire test and they can't focus because they're on a caffeine high. However, maybe the optimal amount of coffee is two cups before the test, and that's where your test participants get 90% and higher. So here, the caffeine is the thing that you change. You are determining how many cups of coffee your test participants are going to drink. So as I just stated then, the dependent variable is the thing that changes according to what the independent variable did. It's the thing that you can observe happening during the experiment. I like to think of this in a kind of Mad Lib scenario. Let's draw a blank and then say depends on blank. Whatever would fit in the first blank would be our dependent variable because it depends on. And then the second blank would be the independent variable. So following suit with the previous example, the test performance would depend on the number of cups of caffeine the test participants drink. If you tried to flip that around, it wouldn't make any sense. If we tried to say that caffeine depends on test performance, well, I didn't realize that the cups of coffee were the ones taking the test. That sentence makes zero sense. So if you're confused on what is what in terms of variables, always plug it into this blank depends on blank format to test your understanding and logic. Here's another silly example. If we were going to talk about a flower and sunshine and try to identify which one would be the dependent or independent variable, let's plug it into our little setup up here. Would we say the sunshine depends on the flower? Now, I didn't realize that that big ball of nuclear reactions up in space depended on a single flower on Earth. No, that's ludicrous. That doesn't make any sense. So the correct way to say this then is that the flower depends on the sun. Therefore, if we were going to test flower growth with, say, UV radiation, we would say that the dependent variable is the growth of the flower and the independent variable is the sunshine. Why don't you give it a try? See if you can identify the independent and dependent variable between the following two options using our blank depends on blank format. Ready, go. Hopefully you found that the first option, the number and or size of the lab generated cells would depend on the amount of phospholipids in the yellow egg yolk. More fat means more cells. Now that we've gone through the entire lab experiment, we can make a conclusion. And the rationale for our inference is going to be on the basis of evidence and or reasoning gathered from the experimentation. This is basically you summarizing what you found in your lab data, plus your own thinking to come up with a logical conclusion. Let's see if you can understand which one would be an appropriate inference, A, B, or C. The vesicles formed because phospholipids have a hydrophilic and hydrophobic tendency. B, the vesicles are spherical. And C, the vesicles are roughly the size of blood cells. If you've seen my test taking video, which is linked in the description below, you would hopefully recognize that one of these things is not like the other, and that's typically the right answer here. The appropriate inference would in fact be that the vesicles formed because phospholipids, fats, have both hydrophilic, water-loving, and hydrophobic, water-fearing tendencies, and that's why they form a sphere. That's how your cells are hypothetically also formed. Notice that I said hypothetically, and not in theory. The vesicles are spherical are merely an observation of the lab itself, and the vesicles are roughly the size of blood cells, also just drawing a parallel between size, or shape, or color. Those are all qualitative observations. Now here's just a few tips and tricks while you're writing your lab report. When you're going through your procedure section for what you did in the experiment, you want to be excruciatingly, painfully detailed. For example, if you were to compare these two paragraphs, go ahead and pause here and read them. All right, I'm assuming you read it all. So between those two, which one would you rather read if you were trying to do the experiment exactly like the person before you did? Hopefully you're recognizing that number one would be a lot easier to follow. It has a lot more detail. It even specifically gives you masses of the amount of material that was used and it even tells you how many radish seeds were used. You wouldn't have to guess how to label either. You know exactly how to label and recreate the same exact experiment the way the previous experimenter would have done. So when it comes to writing out your procedures and what you did, be excruciatingly detailed. Here's a tip. 
that really, really kicks you in the pants if you don't follow it, especially in college lab reports. I saw that often enough when I was grading them. Always proceed a decimal value that's smaller than one with a zero. None of us are perfect, and it's really easy to, instead of writing 0 0.87 grams, to write 0.87 grams, and then later on in your paper, forget the point altogether and write 87 grams. That's a huge difference when you're trying to create a lab report that's reproducible for somebody else to follow. So anytime that you have a value smaller than one, make sure you put a zero in front of it so you don't forget that decimal point. This would also hopefully help you in your calculation section, so you don't end up using 87 grams as your calculating factor instead of 0.87 grams on accident. All the times that I handed out straight up zeros on lab reports for plagiarism. You're literally stealing someone's intellectual property. That is still theft. Anything that doesn't directly come out of your own brain and that isn't considered like common knowledge, for example, the sky is blue, like unless you're colorblind, which I apologize then, but you've probably heard someone then say that the sky is blue. So that's kind of one of those common knowledge things that we're all kind of in agreement. Yeah, the sky is blue. You don't necessarily need to reference that. However, if you're trying to say what the color of the sky is on Saturn, unless that's common knowledge for all of us, you need to reference where that information came from. And the most effective way that you can reference, in my opinion, is by using an MLA format of in-text citation. Meaning that if you were to state that the sky is red at sunset due to the refraction of light off of particles of pollution, well, by golly gee, you could have said that the sky is red at sunset. Most people have seen that. But because you're saying due to the refraction of light off the particles of pollution, that's not common knowledge. Not everybody knows that. So you have to reference it. Notice that this reference is literally in text. It is within the sentence that it's stated. So you are giving the author credit of where that information came from directly in the body of your sentence when you write it. This way your readers will actually give you more credibility as well because they're not assuming that you know everything and that you've actually done your research. So they can trust what you're saying even more when you reference other people that have the credibility to say such things. Then at the end of your lab report, you should also have a full citation, a full reference. So here we would have the in-text citation and your reader could go to your reference page at the very end of your report and see, oh, this is the entire article where that came from if I was interested in reading the article myself. In my years of teaching, I have found that Purdue OWL has been very helpful in terms of referencing MLA format and APA format. Check them out if you need help. And last but not least, here are some conclusion do's and don'ts. If you're going to write a conclusion between these two options, which one do you think is the better conclusion? Go ahead and pause to scan through it. Hopefully you didn't even need to pause. You recognized the one that was longer was much better than just the not acceptable version. This experiment would have been better if we had done it correctly. Oh, you, you don't say. Oh, no. But seriously, you can't imagine the number of times I actually read that as the conclusion for a lab report. What you want to do in a conclusion for a lab report is summarize where the errors lied and how you could have improved. The error wasn't just, we did sloppy work and we were careless and we, we just, you know, we forgot to write down our values. Those aren't errors, those are mistakes and just sloppy work in general. And that's a really shoddy conclusion. However, if you're taking your data and you're actually applying it to try and explain what happened, that is a proper conclusion. Notice how in this first example up here, we are also trying to explain any of the errors we might've encountered. The experiment was performed inside of a classroom where the temperature was not constant. If this was some plant-based experiment where we needed exactly 23 degrees Celsius at all times, period, and no fluctuation, that would be a big error and not something that the student could have controlled. In this lesson, we defined what qualitative, the things that you can see, touch, smell, hear, observations are, versus quantitative, those are numerical observations, such as direct measurements or mass. We also talked about how a hypothesis is much different than a theory and you should be using hypothesis most of the time when you're talking about things in experimentation. We defined a researchable question, an inference, 
and also determine the difference between an independent variable and a dependent variable. We went over readability and professionalism within a lab report procedural summary, how you should always be numerically proficient by putting a zero in front of any value that's less than one, and how you should never steal someone else's intellectual property, always reference. And last but not least, make sure that your conclusions are actually worthwhile and including the data you gathered within the experimentation. Please give this video a quacks cool up and subscribe to Decanta for some more tips and tricks in chemistry and science. May all the chemical reactions go your way and have a ducky day. No ducks, no glory.